Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalist. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we post every week on a Friday. So if you want to follow our continuing adventures, do hit subscribe and follow our continuing adventures. Yes, and of course, don't forget that on Mondays we do our shorts, which are basically answering people's questions. So if you've got an important question about something in your garden, put it in the comments below and we'll try and get to it on one of our Monday shorts. We will. And Stephen, what else could people do if they were interested in horticulture? Well, obviously join a horticultural society. And certainly in Australia, if you're looking for a, a, an interesting horticultural society to join, you could do far worse than join the Royal Horticultural Society of Victoria. Uh, it has, I think, 30,000 members around the country, mm. and it has all sorts of events going on, a very good bulletin that I write for. <laughs> uh, and so why not get involved? Who's the patron? <laughs> <laughs> but now, Stephen, talking of all things horticultural, strangely enough, we are the horticulturalists. Where are we? Ah, well, we're at a friend of mine's nursery in the Dandenongs at a town called Alinda, and it's Gentiana Nursery. The owner is Craig Wilson. So we'll go and have a little chat to Craig and then we'll go off and do a good story. But what are we going to talk about? Ah, well, it's interesting. Tell the people. Yeah, it's interesting because having a walk around Craig's garden here, uh, a few things fell into place. Mm. He's got a very good collection of New Zealand native foliage plants, so mm. plants that are specifically good for their foliages, mm. and he happens to be a Kiwi. So I want to find out whether there's a connection between the two. Oh, wild <laughs> assumption there. But interestingly, when you were in France and that garden story we did, one of the sub themes was that New Zealand plants seem mm. to be quite du jour. Uh, yes, they in were. France. Yeah, they are. And it's interesting also the fact that New Zealand and Australia are very close together geographically, mm. but botanically there's not that much that connects us. Uh, Australia True. tends to spend a lot of time or has spent a lot of time producing flowering plants, things with showy flowers to attract pollinators and mm. things. Uh, the New Zealand native flora seems to be a lot more subtle about flowers, but it has gone a little over the top with foliage, and that's what I want to talk about. And we also did, what is it called, bivaricating? Devericating. Devericating. Yeah. We did a film about those New Zealand Zealand plants that, yeah, that have do that. the yeah. extraordinary uh, stems. So we'll link both of those below and a link to the Royal Horticultural Society, but we should go meet Craig. Let's go and do that. Well, Craig. Hello, Craig. It's lovely to be Hello. back in your nursery again here in the beautiful Dandenong Ranges. I've got a few questions to ask you about today's video because we're going to talk about New Zealand native foliage plants and you've still got a tiny bit of an accent. Some people pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a very interesting collection of them here in your nursery garden, and you also grow many of them and sell them, so mm -hmm. people can come and get them here. But did you plant New Zealand native plants because you were homesick, or is it just about the plant itself and it wouldn't have mattered where it came from? Oh, it's very definitely homesick. <laughs> <laughs> right, good. Yeah. I'm glad I sorted that out. Yeah. yeah, so they're plants that remind you of where you came from. They do. At the back you'll see Antalia arborescens, yeah. which is foul. Mm -hmm. I was brought up in Fowl Valley Road. Ah, so there you go. There so you there's go. a lot of connections there. Yeah. So when we're looking at all these plants, we can think of uh, Craig back home where he came from. There you go. Pondering the fowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just to contextualize then, Gentiana Nursery, what are your specialties here? It's really difficult to say. I grow such a broad array of plants. Mm. Mm. A lot of alpine plants, a lot yep. of small bulbs, yep. shrubs, species plants. Mm. And Craig does have an e-com site, so if you're in Australia, you can certainly buy from Craig. No Australian uh, grower can ship overseas, unfortunately, and you don't ship to the quarantine states no, no, in no, Australia. Don't get accreditation for those. Yeah. There you go, alas. But without yeah. further ado, we should go and see your New Zealand foliage plants. Yes, Indeed. and sure. thank you for inviting thank us. Thank you for letting us wander through. Yeah. Well, Stephen, before we look at some specifics, maybe yeah. let's just have a ramble around Craig's garden so you can put it in context for our viewers. So right. how would you describe the climate here? All right, it's a very benign one. Mm -hmm. It gets coolish in the winter, but rarely gets any sort of frost of any yep. obvious amount. Occasional light fall of snow, mm -hmm. uh, quite good rainfall, mainly winter spring oriented. Yep. Um, because it's not that far away from the coast, in the hot summers, it often gets the coastal sea breezes in the afternoon, which keep the temperatures from getting too terribly hot. It's sounding like paradise. It is, and I'm very jealous because uh, my climate is much colder in the winter, so I get enough frost to do a lot of damage. And right. a number of the plants we'll see today, I probably can't grow. Ah. And of course, our 
summer temperatures are also higher because we're further inland and we don't get the coastal sea breezes. So the array of plants that Craig can grow in his garden here is truly remarkable because he can grow the really cold climate plants. His nursery, in fact, has a lot of alpine, so he can grow those sorts of plants. But he can also grow things that are basically subtropical and almost into tropical plants, which pushes me out. I can't manage those plants at all. Fantastic. So just to give people a context, here is a lemon tree. Yes, with lots of nice lemons on it. And then behind us there are camellias in yes. bloom. And, and we big have, old weeping maples still bare. And there are magnolias, there are azaleas. Um, there are tree ferns. Tree there, ferns. Yeah. Fuchsias, there's a fuchsia over there. Yeah, so really a real mix. A real mix. Mm. So um, they're not really limited by any of their um, climatic conditions here because yeah. it's so benign, both cold-wise and to an extent heat-wise. So just to contextualise this for everyone again, we're in a mountain range called the Dandenongs, which are to the northeast of Melbourne. Yep, it rarely goes above the thousand metres uh, above sea level, mm. and so therefore is not high high, but high enough to moderate the climate. And you are northwest and more inland yes, in Macedonia. Yes, most definitely. Mm. Mm. So. A, completely different climate. It's funny because in Victoria a lot of people put the Dandenong Ranges and the Macedon Ranges basically in the same I would have. category yeah. and they're actually substantially different climates. Interesting. Okay, well now we've we've established ourselves. Yeah. Let's go and look at some of these New Zealand plants. All right, what a good idea. All right, Stephen, first New Zealand cab off the rank. And it starts with an A, so maybe we're ah. doing this alphabetically. A to Z, yeah. New Zealand flora. Now, Astelias are a group of strappy leaf plants yeah. that are not as commonly used in gardens as some of their New Zealand compatriots. Things like the formiums or the New Zealand flaxes. Which I dislike. Yeah, some people yeah, just can't get their head around the flaxes. Some of them are good. I like some of them. Well, there is an attractive one here. Yeah, there's so a really will... nice cultivar we'll have a look at. It's the form. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get yeah, to that. Yeah, we'll get that to that. Part. Now, Astelias are more moisture requiring than your average flax, although flaxes are very happy in wet spots spots as well. Yeah. Uh, this particular one behind us is probably, I would say, the creme de la creme Ooh, of uh, as, Astelias. As Miss Jean Brodie would have said. And this is Astelia chapmanica, mm. often called a silver sword mm. for obvious reasons. Mm. Uh, and it does come from the Chatham Islands, which are a small group of islands off the east coast of New Zealand, almost out from Christchurch. Mm. And they're almost always shred, uh, shrouded in cloud. Uh, it's always damp. You need to, the, the footwear of choice in the Chathams is gumboots. And this plant grows in that mist enshrouded uh, environment. And is the Chathams one of those places where megafauna has yes. megaflora? F megaflora, yes. Megafauna <laughs> hasn't found its way to the Chathams. Megaflora, everything's supersized. Well. Well, not no, everything. not everything, but there are a range of plants that have developed extremely large versions mm. of what you might find on mainland New Zealand. So, mm. Or in fact, uh, completely unrelated things like the giant Chatham Island forget-me-not, the yeah. Mycetidium, which is a beautiful plant. Which I just killed. You I, gave it to me. Yeah, yeah. Oh. well, it's not an easy plant to keep. But anyhow, getting back to Astelias, mm. they nearly all grow in damp environments wherever they grow. So this one from the Chatham Islands grows naturally in a damp environment because that's what the Chathams are. Mm. Those that are on the mainland of New Zealand do tend to be sort of in the higher damper sort of rainforesty type conditions as well so they all tend to enjoy that sort of conditions the other interesting thing about them although they're all flowering plants they do mm. get flowers on them what's the flower like it's not particularly impressive because it tends to sit down and amongst the foliage it's a sort of a branchy flower spike with little tiny flowers generally in much the same color as the foliage mm. so the flowers are not that showy, but if you end up with a female plant that gets pollinated, uh, the flower heads will often turn into clusters of quite attractive orange berries. So a, a, a question, uh, what is this film on the leaf, this grey silver shimmer? It's very beautiful. Yeah, and it's not a fur like most grey foliage plants. Yeah. It's more more like a lacquer, it's more like a, uh, a coating on the leaves. Mm. And I'm assuming it's developed to actually encourage water to run off mm. the foliage in the case of this plant. Mm. So most grey foliage plants develop a fur over the surface of the leaves to protect them from heat and dryness. Mm. Uh, in the case of this one, I actually think its, uh, its main pr uh, aim is to shed water off its foliage. Mm. So beautiful and thing. What family is it? Because it looks a little bit 
when we were in the Melbourne University Gardens, there was that form of a bromeliad called Puya. Puya. Yes. So this looks a little bit yeah. like no relationship whatsoever. But it doesn't but, look like a flax. No, it's it, well, it's got strappy leaves, and that's about it. So, it looks like it might be sharp or more in the sort yeah. of agave family. Yeah, well, and it's not. No. Uh, Astelia. Yeah. If I remember rightly, it's in its own family. Mm. So, and it doesn't just stay in New Zealand, but New Zealand is where the most ornamental and attractive forms have developed. Uh, we have some little alpine ones in Australia that only grow about that big and have virtually no garden merit whatsoever. Uh, I've seen one growing as an epiphyte in uh, the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean. So I think they're all Southern Hemisphere, but New Zealand is sort of where they've developed in their most amazing forms and shapes and, and colours. So given it's from the Chatham Islands, what's its hardiness? What could it go down it's to? It's not going to go down to very frosty conditions at all mm. it'll just take very minor one to two degree frosts mm. beyond that it's likely to turn to mush it needs to be just on the uh on, on the upward side of the frosty the other level. side of freezing yes exactly so so none of the uh astelias are overly cold tolerant mm. and none of them are particularly drought tolerant either so you do have to get that happy medium which apparently the dandy nong rangers does with a plom yeah yeah, yeah. There you go and weren't you saying that it's unusual that this is a light reflector yes Mm. Yeah, so uh, when the grey foliage is because most of them are actually due to the fact that the leaves are furry, mm. uh, they tend to be light absorbing. Mm. So grey foliage is in a really hot climate like Australia can often look dry and mean and miserable. Mm. You take them to a damper climate and they can often be quite glistening. That's why silver borders are popular in England, but not so popular here. Mm. The Astelia sort of bucks the trend because it's got a silver foliage that's also light reflective. So mm. it looks lively and interesting mm. as opposed to being dry and, and harsh looking. There you go. So. Yeah. All right, on to the next. Well, we'll go and have another look at a different Astelia because I think it's a genus that we need to engage with a little bit more than just looking at one. Okay. All right, Stephen. All right. Is this a cousin? It is, in fact, another Astelia. So this one's one of the selections or hybrids of Astelia nervosa, which is one of the mainland New Zealand uh, species. Mm -hmm. And they've been breeding and selecting plants with particularly coppery bronzy leaves. Mm. And this is a cultivar known as Westland. It doesn't grow terribly big, around about the metre or a metre and a bit, unlike Chathamica, which grows much larger. And it has this remarkable sort of, again, slightly glistening coppery leaf, not yeah. a, a matte, uh, dull leaf and makes a wonderful addition to the garden. I do think they look bromeliad-y, yeah. pineapple-y. Yeah, they're not. I know, I know, but they look like it. Yeah, well, that's like euphorbias looking like cactuses in one of oh, our previous stories. So, I'm still recovering from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so... It was you know, very trying. Plants evolve in similar lines even when they're not related because mm. of similar conditions in the environment. So, mm. you know, completely unrelated things can look like they belong where they actually don't. And that's unfortunately one of the complications for the average home gardener. There you go. On to the next. Yes, let's go and have a look at another plant with strappy leaves, but probably not an Astelia. Okay. I've got another one lined up for you just over there. Off we go. <laughs> All right, Matthew, we've ascertained that New Zealand does a lot of bronze foliage plants before. And here is yet another one of them. And this is commonly known as the hook rush and it's botanically Uncinia rubra, and it grows in swampy, boggy areas and along stream sides up in the hills and mountains in New Zealand. So it likes a fair bit of moisture. And it's a plant that I first came across when I was a young man trekking in the hills of New Zealand, and nobody warned me about hook rush. And if you happen to stupidly walk through a batch of it with bare legs, as one does when one's out trekking in your shorts, uh, the seeds will stick to the hairs on your legs. And to get the seeds out, you have to pluck the hair. So it's not a plant that I thought I'd ever want to have in my own garden, but it has a lovely bronze foliage effect. Yes, I just wear long pants around it is the best thing I can suggest you do. This plant is reasonably hardy. It wouldn't go down to minus 10 or something like that, but it would go down to minus two or three degrees Celsius without even blinking. In fact, that might even bring up the burgundy colors in the winter even better. But the big trick with it is, is to grow it somewhere where it gets adequate summer moisture. And it does come in sort of more greeny forms, but um, in the right aspect, it gets a lovely coppery brown colour to it. And the colour does tend to intensify with the cold of winter. So in the winter months, it can look particularly showy. So Uncinia rubra or New Zealand hook rush. And I'm not getting too close. 
What's this, Stephen? This is gorgeous. Oh, it's a wonderful plant. And I have tried a couple of times to grow it. And? Frost. Ah. Uh, so well, that just goes to illustrate the different climates here. Exactly. I mean, in the Dandenongs, you can grow this plant, which comes from the far north of the North Island of mm. New Zealand, and I think on some of the offshore islands as well. And it's Myrtia Sinclairi, which is known in New Zealand by one of its um, Maori names, which is Puka, mm -hmm. P-U-K-A, uh, although there's another plant known by the same common name, so it can get a bit confusing. And it makes a large shrub slash small tree with these wonderful big lustrous green leaves. And it's in the same family as Fatsia, the uh, Fatsia japonica, ah. and all those things, Aureliaceae. Well, we have made an Aureliaceae Epic. Yep. We'll, we'll link that below. Yeah. Yep. So this adds to our whole contingent of Aurelia. Now I know this is all about foliage plants, but does this flower? Oh yeah, it'll get the well classical Aureliaceae flowers, small green things in clusters. Mm. Basically, most of them tend to flower that way. So the flowers can be interesting, but I wouldn't see them as being overly showy. It's really all about the foliage. Now the form of this, it's sent up several sort of verticals. Yeah. Is that what it's going to do? Is it prunable to make it bushier? How would you maintain it? Well, it is prunable, so you could certainly cut it right back and start it off again. Mm. Uh, there's every likelihood this one was pruned at some stage yeah. because it can sometimes make a single trunk tree and then branch out above. I've seen it in, in New Zealand grown that way where it's actually a small shade tree, really. But yes, very prunable uh, and quite vigorous when it is pruned, so it will replace itself quite fast. Well, I guess if you wanted it to be kind of this height as a foliage backdrop in a border, would you just coppice it every year? Like well, not coral. every year, but every few years, you just take it back down to a stump at the bottom mm. and start it off again. And of course, anything you coppice, because it's got a big root system under it, uh, the new growth that comes up will be vigorous, strong, mm. and extra large leafed, which is always the point with these plants. However, not a plant for cooler climate. So you could perhaps grow this in, say, Cornwall or parts of southern England. Even then you might be pushing it. Mm. So it really is a plant that requires a virtual frost-free climate. A temperate climate. Yeah. Temperate like climate. Here. Yeah, so pro it, it'd probably go wild in Hawaii. But uh, um, Oh, so it can take the other extreme It can topics. go into, well, because it comes from the northern parts of the northern island of New Zealand and some of their northern um, uh, offshore islands, uh, it is in fact uh, really, I guess, a tropical. But it will go down to uh, cooler climates like mm. this one mm. and still perform quite well. So wonderful plant, Myrtia sinclairii. It is. It's really gorgeous. All right. On to the next. Yes, let's go. Now, like, this looks fabulous. Yes, now again we're in the Aureliaceae family. It's amazing how often we seem to be engaging with this group of plants. Mm. And this is a Pseudopanax, Pseudopanax arboreus. Now in our Aureliaceae film we made we saw that beautiful Pseudopanax with the very long serrated brown yes, leaves. Yes, Pseudopanax ferox. Yes. And we'll engage with another species here of that same style of Pseudopanax. Mm. But this one arboreus, which of course means tree-like is a big leaf one again a northern one in New Zealand and so therefore a little bit cold sensitive more mm. so than some of the other pseudopanaxes. And is that the damage that we're seeing on the leaves? Yeah the damaged leaves here are just winter cold damage. The plant has recently been pruned by the looks of it. It's just starting to break into new growth now. Yeah. It can make a substantial bush slash even moderate sized tree. Mm. It's of course evergreen and in New Zealand they call it five finger. One two three four five. Okay, I get it. <laughs> yes, although I have to say, if you really look hard, you'll probably find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can, in fact, find leaves that aren't five lobed or five leafleted, yeah. but most of them are five. So again, this is from the north of the Northern Ireland, so yeah, more or less, subtropical. Yeah. Yep. And Craig's obviously pruned this a lot. So again, to create that sort of medium height foliage specimen, yeah. you would just keep pruning it. Yeah, and you'd probably need to do this almost yearly if it's in a climate where it's happy, yeah. because it can grow quite quickly during the growing season, yeah. and you could end up with quite a substantial plant mm. uh, after one year's growth. Yeah. But uh, I've seen them in the wild. Uh, they can be four or five meters tall. So, you know, a moderate sized tree. Now it's under like part shade, whatever tree this is, deciduous tree. Mm -hmm. So full sun, 
Uh, look, half, they'll half. cope with a fair bit of sun, mm -hmm. but they're quite good in semi-shade to even full shade. Yeah. So it's quite an adaptable plant. It's reasonably drought tolerant once its roots get down. Mm. Uh, although having said that, you wouldn't take it into the desert or something like that. That would be taking it too far. But in normal garden conditions in Southern Victoria, it doesn't need a lot of watering, mm. but it is just slightly frost tender. So some areas it wouldn't be any good in. Fantastic. All but right. it's a lovely plant. Is there anything else? Oh yes, well we've got some more pseudopanaxes, so why don't we have a look at another one of those? Okay. Now, this has the most beautiful foliage. Yes, now we have engaged with one of the other pseudopanaxes in this same group before, yes. which was Pseudopanax ferox, uh, the serrated lancewood. Mm. Uh, this one is Pseudopanax crassifolium, and it has a more smooth edged leaf and it has this fabulous pale vein that runs right down the middle the of the colour, leaf. The colour, it's sensational because yeah. the leaf itself is sort of, I don't know, like patinated bronze and then yeah. you've got this pale vein. Stunning. It's beautiful. Now this is juvenile though. Mm. It Once it gets to adult form and as we said before, above mower height, above mower height then its foliage reduces in size and it goes greener and you'll end up with something that's sort of like a lollipop on a stick. And what Craig's doing here, if we look right down into it, you'll see that there are multitudes of areas where he's pruned. Mm. The idea being to keep this plant in its juvenile form. Mm. So by coppicing it down or pollarding it down, whichever way you want to look at it, mm. uh, on a semi-regular basis, then with any luck at all, he'll be able to keep it as a juvenile plant and the foliage will be at or around eye level mm. so that it's not way up in the air above you. Mm. So it becomes a more useful garden plant if it's pruned appropriately. And it's absolutely beautiful. So whereabouts in New Zealand is this from? Well, this one comes from much further south than the other pseudopanax we're looking at over the other ah. side. So this one's comparatively cold hardy. Mm. It will go down to several degrees of frost. Mm. Um, I can grow this perfectly well at Macedon, right. uh, as I can ferox, the other uh, spiky edged one. So these you could grow in Southern Britain? Oh yes, I, I think you would be able to grow these in Cornwall or on the Isle of Man. So I'm sure there are gardens in, uh, in England where they've got pseudopanax crassifolium. Mm. So if it's not pruned though, you end up with a lollipop shaped tree that could be four or five meters tall. Mm. So it's quite a substantial plant. Mm. But growing it this way, I think it makes a very useful garden ornament. Yes. Is there anything else? Yes, I can. We could spend all day at Craig's uh, garden, but we'll go and have a look at one or two more, but then we might have to call it quits because we've probably, you know, expended enough time on these plants. But right. they are fabulous and definitely worth looking at. All right, let's go. All right. All right, here we have a really interesting New Zealand native shrub. This is Pseudo Wintera colorata. And we did actually feature this in my French epic where we were looking at uh, plant collectors' gardens in Normandy and Brittany. Uh, there was a garden we visited there, Curdolo, that had pruned mounds of one of the forms of this pseudo wintera. There's only the one species I'm familiar with, but it does throw different forms. And this is one called, rather appropriately, red leopard, because it's all spotty. And the thing I love about pseudo winterers is that if you turn the leaves upside down and look at the back of the leaf, they have this wonderful whitish colour on the back of the leaf as well. So there's lots of different sort of colours that show up in the foliage of this. So I see it as a, well, as a really good foliage plant for not quite frost free climates, uh, not hot and dry climates, uh, somewhere where you can keep the moisture up to it in the summer. And it really is a fabulous shrub and if let grow it can get to even small tree size eventually. So Stephen, I am not a lover of New Zealand flax generally. Yeah, well, formiums have their place, but mm. I can understand why you would be because a lot of the bigger growing ones tend to have leaves that want to sit straight up and then they and don't. They snap. They snap in the middle of the leaf yes. and you get this very untidy look to them. That is exactly it. But you, in mm. your garden, which we've covered, have a very elegant form. Which is similar to this and may yes. even be the same one. Yes. This is one of the hybrids of formium cookianum, the mountain flax. Mm. And the mountain flax does make a rather neat small plant mm. with these sort of beautifully arching leaves. Yeah. Uh, and this cream variegated one is particularly splendid. Of course, they do flower, but it's grown basically for its foliage. And I, I do like this variegation. <laughs> Heaven help us. Yeah, and, and, and it goes very well with the variegated quarter line behind. <laughs> that so, I'm ambivalent about. Yeah. This is beautiful. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what the cultivar is, mm. but uh, if you're looking for a good flax out there, the hybrids of Cookie Anum are really worthwhile looking out for. Mm. They're not as big but they do have great presence and they have that nice archiness, which I think is very elegant indeed. Yeah, yeah, it is very handsome. 
What is the hardiness of this? Uh, well, again, formiums won't go down to really low temperatures. You, mm. you tend to find that they will, uh, the bottom of the plant will turn to mush if it gets really frozen. Right. So they'll cope with quite cold weather, but they won't cope with lots of heavy frost on them. Mm. So they'll go down to a few degrees of frost. So mm. they'll take quite a bit. But if you take them to somewhere like perhaps uh, northern North America or into Canada, they'll often get wiped right out in the winter with the frosts. Mm. So southern England, most parts of southern Australia are fine, of course, because we don't get that sort of cold. And they are a little more water hungry than a lot of people imagine. They think of flax as being quite drought tolerant. Yes, I would have. In their natural habitat, they often grow in swamps and bogs. Mm. So they're happy in very damp conditions. And in fact, when we went through the millennial drought, a lot of people had flaxes that either completely gave up or looked so bad you wish they had because they had die yeah, yes get, get out of here we don't need you anymore you look awful so they do need a bit of summer irrigation to keep mm. them happy they don't need to be kept wet but they're happy to be wet mm. interesting all right all right was there something just over yeah, there yeah i've got one or two more that we want to fit in before this becomes an enormously long epic okay. but another couple of interesting new zealand plants to go let's go all right, now this is a New Zealand plant that is in the classical mode of a lot of New Zealand plants that we're aware of. It's got small bronzy leaves and it's devericated. Now we have mentioned in one of our previous videos uh, the fact that deverication and bronze foliage might have a lot to do with the giant mower birds of New Zealand, making it harder for them to peck the leaves off. But it could also be uh, a climatic thing. So in harsh climates and coastal areas, the smaller leaves are less likely to be damaged by the salt winds. The bronze colour, not quite sure how that fits into the whole scenario, but it's certainly something that happens regularly in New Zealand. And believe it or not, this is a species of Petosporum. And most of us are aware of Petosporums with much larger leaves, uh, much more obvious looking shrubs. And this is fabulously called Petosporum anomala because it's a bit of an anomaly in the genus. And so it's yet another one of New Zealand's strange devericated plants. And we might, we've put it in with foliage plants and in a sense it's more about texture than foliage, but it sort of fits that non-flowery, I'm an interesting plant look. I think this is a plant that only a mother could love, Stephen. Uh, it's possible that it could fit into that category. Yes. Uh, a, lot of like, a lot like those cactuses and euphorbias that we've seen at different places mm. that also, I think, sometimes are only loved by their mothers. But anyhow, mm. it different does, tastes. It does look a bit dead sticky. Yes, it does look a bit dead sticky, but it, it does have textural quality and it could look fabulous with a couple of great big boulders and, you know, that sort of coastal effect uh, looking like one of those moundy things that grow there. Okay. Wow. Now there's a leaf. And wow is its common name. No. <laughs> W-H-A-U. Uh, I assume it's pronounced something like wow. Mm. Uh, it's also known as um, New Zealand corkwood. Yeah. It's a small multi-branch tree, big soft green leaves. It's mm. evergreen, although it gets scruffy when there's a little bit of frost. Mm. And it's one of the few things we've looked at today that does actually have flowers of merit. Mm. It gets quite attractive clusters, quite large clusters of white flowers yeah. with a massive stamens in the middle, flowers in late spring, early summer. But it is really about its bold and beautiful leaves that you would grow it basically. Yeah, uh, massive leaves. Yeah, it's in the Melvasi family, so it's related to hibiscuses, abutilins, all that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And it's a supposed to have wood that is even lighter than balsa wood. Mm. So it's the world's lightest wood, apparently. And did you say how big it can get? Uh, I'm not sure that I did, but it can get to four, maybe five metres, uh, but very prunable. And in I fact, say, Craig has pruned this one back quite hard, and I'd say virtually every year. So, so this is one of those things that he's almost coppicing. Yes, yes. Mm. So he's keeping it down. He's using it to hide the house on the other side of the fence. Mm. Uh, so he wants it down at eye level and a little above. Mm. And so by pruning it hard in the late winter, this is all shot away again. So we're in sort of early spring still really, but yeah. it's all shot madly. It's already got flower buds starting to form in it. So over the next few weeks, it'll be a mass of white flowers as well. So Entelia arborescens. Now whereabouts in New Zealand? North, south? Northish. It's certainly North Island, but halfway up the North Island. And so again, further. more subtropical. More subtropical. Mm. Uh, I've got a sense that if I find the right spot for it in the garden at home, I might just get away with this one at Macedon. Yeah. But it will be touch and go and it'll always get frosted in the winter. Yeah. It's a matter of building enough enough woody stuff at the bottom mm. so that if it gets frosted it's got something to reshoot from but i think it's a fabulous foliage plant and if it's happy it can put on meter and meter and a half a year 
So it wow. can grow really quickly. It's a very fast growing plant. It's obviously one of those things that is a um, pioneer species in the wild. So wherever there's a disturbed area, there might be a landslide or a slip of some sort or what have you, the intellias will come up first, bind the ground, and then the more permanent plants will come in and take over. Mm. And I guess, I mean, you were just mentioning the north and the south. Interesting for people to understand that New Zealand, obviously two major land masses and then associated islands, but very different climatically. Oh yes, you get down to the south of the South Island and people's fish ponds freeze over in the winter, uh, there's snow, uh, you know, they get quite cold. And then in the north, it's more like Sydney, subtropical yeah. climate. Yeah. And yeah. virtually never gets any frost. Yeah. And so they can grow quite tropical plants in that part of New Zealand. So mm. it does cover a very wide climatic range. Yeah, I think there is, one more thing for us to look yeah, at. Yeah, look, we probably should engage with this one, although I have to say, for me, this last one we're going to look at, yes, it fits our foliage plant uh, category, but certainly in Australia. But it's common. Yes, it, it actually shows up in the box stores and places like that. So, <laughs> Stephen, yeah. okay, All right, I'm being a snob. yourself. Yes. All right, I'm now going to be a complete and utter snob here, but these selection of hybrid coprosmas from New Zealand, and I'm not sure whether this is Pacific Sunrise, Pacific Sunset, Tequila Sunrise. There's a whole range of these hybrids that have been bred, mainly in New Zealand. They've become really popular fodder in the barns and the general garden centres. I can sort of see why. They grow fast, they're remarkably colourful, and they're pretty hardy plants. They'll go down to a few degrees of frost. They're reasonably drought tolerant once their roots are down. They grow remarkably quickly. They're trimmable. You could turn them into a bright red ball or a hedge or whatever you want. But for me, they've sort of lost any point because they're just everywhere. But, you know, again, it's an interesting group of New Zealand native plants and they've found a quite large niche in horticulture. Now, another shrub we've engaged with before yes. uh, are the New Zealand peppers, mm. uh, which used to be macro pippa meaning big peppers, mm. but are now included in the genus Pippa itself. Mm -hmm. So they're now known as Pippa excelsa. Although this one here, there's some dispute over. Craig grows it as the Kermadec Island form of Pippa excelsum. I grow it as the um, Three Kings Island form, which uh, is uh, macro, or oh, not macro Pippa anymore, but Pippa, uh, Melchior, named after one of the three Wise men. Right. So I would see it as Melchior. Craig's got it as Excelsa, but in the Kermadec Island form. And just next to us over here, where we'll swing the camera around at some stage, is the North Island form. Now, although they're members of the Pepper family, yeah. are these berry producing? Yeah, they do produce berries, but mm. you wouldn't use the berries necessarily for substitute for pepper. Mm. But the leaves have a peppery flavour to them, uh, and they're often used to flavour foods ah. or for medicinal things. And in fact, nowadays they're also using it to flavour gin. Oh, fantastic. This is a very handsome plant. Will it get much bigger than this? Uh, about half as big again if it's not pruned, but you can cut them back quite hard. Despite the lack of clarity about which island it's from, where are those islands, south or north? North. North, so again, so, yeah, subtropical. Yes, yeah, so they're subtropical. Mm. This one does get frosted in my garden, but if yeah. I find a nice sheltered spot for it, it comes through the winter all right. In fact, the other one does as well, the North Island one, mm. also gets frosted at home if we get a heavy enough one. So they're certainly not for frosty climates, only one or two degrees of frost at the absolute maximum. Mm. Beautiful thing. Well, with the miracle of science, we will swing the camera around and we'll end kind of where we've often begun in your garden because this is a shade, a dry shade tolerant plant. Yeah, exactly. Let's so go. what is this one? Well, this is straight Pippa excelsum. Yeah. So known in New Zealand as Kawa Kawa mm. and very popular as a medicinal plant. Yeah. Again, a great shade tolerant, dry tolerant garden shrub, but not highly frost resistant. Mm. So one or two degrees of frost only. So it's a great shrub. I like its uh, dark stems. I like its beautiful uh, heart shaped leaf. And I only wish I could get my hands on the variegated leaf one from New Zealand, just to rub that in your face. There's a variegated one that has a gold scent into the leaf, which I think is a fabulous plant. Oh, that does sound quite beautiful. Yeah. Well, I have loved our epic through Craig's collection of New Zealand foliage plants. Yes, and he's got lots of others, but anyhow, we've hit the high spots, I think. We have. So remember, Gentiana Nursery is available to come and visit. Yep. And Craig does sell online, but not internationally and not to the quarantine states in Australia. 
Yes, so do come and visit the nursery because you're bound to walk out with the plants you didn't know you needed. Absolutely. Now, if you want to know what we're doing next week, hit subscribe. We post every Friday. Yes, and don't forget, if you've got a burning horticultural question, put it in the comment section below. Tell me where you're from so that I have context and I will try and answer your question in 60 seconds and that will show up on our Monday shorts. So until then, we'll see you next week. All right, bye everybody.